I'm going to talk to you about something that possibly you have not thought of, but is going to be in tune with what is here, put for thought quite literally. If you have an idea, unless the idea is absurd, the idea is outrageous, the idea is not a good idea. The more absurd it is, the more outrageous it is, the more impossible it is, it will not be successful. Like Einstein said, if the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for the idea because the most absurd ideas always come true. Look at the idea of printing. Ever since man learned how to speak, man was constrained, the human beings were constrained by an ability to reproduce knowledge. Until the printing press came on the scene, there could not be large scale reproduction of knowledge. Look at, the, look at the idea of the World Wide Web, a portal where everybody all over the world could get connected because the first time ever since human civilization started, the world's accumulated knowledge is in one single source available to everybody and see how the field has been leveled. So all great things come out of great ideas which look absurd all the while. Innovation is an act that endows resources with a new capacity to create, to create wealth. Now all ideas could be innovative, all ideas do not be innovative. But truly those ideas which are innovative are the ideas which create wealth. And innovation comes when you do something which is very different, very new, maybe very simple, and so very, let's say, absurd that nobody has thought about it. When you want to innovate, you've got to question long-standing norms. Why do things happen that way? Why should things be as it is? Why can't things be very different? Gandhi asked the question, why can't I use non-violence to get freedom for people? Because still Gandhi came on the scene, nobody thought that you could get something politically without the use of violence. So there's always violence. And Gandhi thought, why cannot I as an individual <coughs> use my moral force to do something which is very big? He took on the greatest empire the world has seen to give freedom to 60% of humanity. It was a simple idea, an extraordinary idea. But the idea looks so impos impossible to work. But then it worked, and it changed the entire world. You should question existing methods. And Gandhi's example is another example of how you can question the way things are being done. Now let me give you another example from Gandhi's life. Gandhi thought about the Dandi March. The Dandi March is a simple march because the British in colonial India had put a tax on water and salt. Why water and salt? Because water and salt are essential for living, for everybody. So salt could not be made by anybody and you had to pay a tax. And he said, I'm going to march alone but it follows the if they want, and I'm going to create salt. He marched for maybe, I don't know, maybe 30 days, 40 days, or whatever it is. He had a great degree of followers, and the entire world stood up in awe with this simple man with a loincloth marching to create salt. And salt, why salt? What has salt got to do with freedom? But the act of creating salt was an act of defiance against established authority. And that act of defiance gave hope to millions of people that they could stand up. So, Question existing methods. And the methods earlier were you took your violence, you took the gun, you shot somebody, and then you got it. Those of you who have been a little bit maybe older would have seen the famous photograph of a young Chinese student standing up before a tank showing his gun at him with a small flower in his hand. Just imagine the scene. You are in Tiananmen Square, in the very large square, there are tanks coming at you. Here is this young kid, like one of you, standing up, the tank is pointing at him and he's giving it a flower. Just look at that. The idea of this young man to go off with a flower to a tank which is pointing a gun, an act of courage. But those kids asked why we couldn't do things very differently. And that I think changed the way China behaves. They changed the idea of freedom. Deduce the required skills. Ask what? To innovate, you need to have the proper skills and you get the answer if you ask what can be done and how it can be done. Look at the concept of solar energy. Now the concept of solar energy is, it's very simple to have a device where the sun's rays will come and heat up something and do something else. But people are working on very innovative ideas where they're going to have an array of solar, uh, solar uh, structures to focus the heat of the sun on a particular point and that point is going to be so hot that it's going to create steam and then create generation. They are also going to try to work on some, some areas where you are going to heat this heat energy to radiate upwards and then downwards again through a satellite using some arrays in deep space. So if you question established ways, 
to the plastic what, you will come to an answer. So ideas, execution, ideas required to be executed and to execute, you need innovation. Then, innovation lies not just the birth of an idea but in execution because execution is extremely important. Now, you and I could have an idea, could have ideas, we could debate. Unless the idea is executed, you will not be able to see the impact. So execution is most things and execution is very, very difficult. You heard of uh, Thomas Alva Edison failed many, many times and you finally came out with the light bulb and it changed the course of humanity and civilization. You had uh, many great investors who just went on and on but you are persevering to do it and I think execution requires tremendous, well, tre tremendous, uh, let's say, perseverance. Let me give you a small example that we did in real life uh, with a very simple idea. And the idea was very simple. The surest way to break out of the cycle of poverty is education. Do you agree with me? Yes. Right? An educated person is not hungry. He is hungry, he is an ass. Do you agree? Yes. Right. And why is that? Because education empowers you to negotiate. To negotiate the rest of society. We know this. This is a very simple idea. I give you a simple statement. That the surest way to break out a cycle of poverty is education. What is the problem? Close to 13.5 million children in India are out of school into child labor in order to earn a single meal in a day. 45% of children in India are malnourished. You know that? 45% of children age group 0 to 5 are malnourished. They are not going to grow up with their full potential. I saw a statement in the media just the other day. We said that between uh, 1995 and 2011, uh, they had a, a survey of young people who grew up during that era in good families and they grow four and a half inches taller and 10 kgs heavier. Four and a half inches. In the last 15, 20 years, four and a half inches. Four and a half inches taller and 10 kgs heavier. Not like this, but a little bit like this. But all the same, all the same, look at the tragedy of the statements. So this is the problem that we had when we faced, uh, you know, when we sat down and thought about something about 12 years ago. We said, we must do something. So what do you, what, what do, you do? How do you solve the problem of getting children to stay in school? Why do children go out of school? Because they have to feed their, well, they, have to get, they, have, they have to find food for themselves and they are hungry. So, we came up with the mission, provide children with a healthy, balanced meal, so they would otherwise have to work for an incentive to continue education. We said, no child <coughs> should be go hungry because of what of means. No child should be deprived of education because of what of means. A single line statement, very simple, even the moron understand, even me understand what it means. So we said, we have this problem, this is how we are going to solve it. But then, when we look at the solution for this problem, we ran into many, many implementation issues. How do we implement this? What should we do to implement this? What are the challenges? The challenges are, if you want to have a large scale video meal program, you have to build a delivery infrastructure, you have to have college quality assurance, you don't have money, you got nothing, and you need to partner with government. But most important of all, you have to build scale. If you want to solve the problem of society in a large way, you have to build scale. And why is scale important? Because this is a country of scale. There are 1.2 million people in this country. There are millions of kids out of school. There are 250 million children in this country. Do you know that? 250 million children. Every year, 25 million children are born in this country. It is a very large country. There is no country like India except China. And China is maybe 20 years ahead. So we have to face the question of scale. So we came out of the strategy and today, please look at this. We feed 13,40,000 children across 8 states of India, especially states in all states. It's the largest vegetarian program in the world. We have built automated kitchens. We can cook 200,000 meals using steam untouched by human hands every six hours. We have 450 vehicles in which these meals are packed in stainless steel containers and it goes to all the schools. They leave the kitchen at 9.30, leave the schools at 11 o'clock. And some schools are 50, 60 kilometers ahead and they have to go the right time. Is the problem in logistics? Is the problem in execution? Is the problem in hygiene? Is the problem in quality? Is the problem in management? Is the problem in almost everything? About 20 tons of food is cooked every single day. Just imagine the scale of this issue. And every child has to get a hot midday meal every single day. And the child is very sensitive, mark you. While you and I could possibly make do with bad food once in a while, a child will spit it out. 
a child is, you know, very reactive, right? Works to, you know, whatever they think is right. They don't think like you and I. And these are young kids. So what did he do? We said, we wanted to innovate, we wanted to prove a point. We first said we'll have, we'll feed 1,500 children. And we fed 1,500 children. Then he said we'll go to 30,000. We went to 30,000, we had a grant of 25,000 for some foundation from America, set up by American Indians. Indian Americans, yes, Indian Americans. <laughs> and they gave us some money. And then they said, you make 30,000 for God's sake, please stop putting process, putting management, build a corporate, you've got no money. Then we sat back and said, so long as the child is hungry, we'll feed the child, forget the corpus, forget everything else. He said, building a corpus is, he said, building a corpus is capitalization of misery. What does that mean? It means, you build a corpus, you get a yield of 78%. So only 78% of the corpus can be used to alleviate hunger every single day. But he said, we've got to use that 100%. So we have no corpus. And today we spend 150 crores a year. We built partnership with governments, we did advocacy, we built kitchens, each kitchen cost us 10 crore rupees. We have 17 kitchens all over India. All over India we have 17 kitchens. People get up at 2.30 in the morning and finish the cooking by about 8.30. Until and this year, possibly in April or May, we're going to complete 1 billion meals in 12 years. 1 billion meals. Nobody has cooked 1 billion meals. So what did it do? We put in governance and transparency. We had a not-for-profit foundation. We had some good people, mainly us. And we made sure that everything was properly accounted, everything was done ethically, there were quality standards, and we laid down standards, and no compromise. No compromise. No prisoners are going to be taken. No, we're not going to allow anything to fall apart. Things have to be the way they are every single day, and every meal has to be good. And if the cooks don't cook well, they've got to eat the food themselves. <laughs> So we said we got to have a team of dedicated, talented individuals. So we built up a small team all over the place. <coughs> we worked with ISKCON. Now ISKCON is a religious organization. Why did we work with them? Because ISKCON Bangalore is very unique. They have 100 people who are MBAs and engineers. Highly educated. They have a deep calling. And we are a secular organization. So we said we are working with a religious organization for a secular purpose. How do we marry this to make sure there is no conflict of interest? Because we need people to get up at 2.30 in the morning to work. How many of you are willing to get up at 2.30 in the morning every single day to go to a kitchen and manage a kitchen? Any volunteers? <laughs> no volunteers. So we said, we're not going to do it. We can't do it. We can possibly go get some money, we can do government, we can do quality, but we can't get up at 2.30 for God's sake. So we asked them to do it. Until today, they have managed the entire show. We got 3,500 employees, maybe 50 volunteers from ISKCON who do it, and they run those 17 kitchens, and they execute very well. But we said we have to be secular, because the child has no religion. So we said we'll feed children in government schools, because government schools have a secular policy for admission. Any child can go get admitted to a government school. The government will never turn them away. So the poorest of the poor go to government school. My mother went to a government school. She was first in the school district in SLSC. But those days, government schools were the only schools around. There weren't any schools. Now, the moment you get money, you want to put a child in a private school because the schools don't run well. So we said, we are going to create a model and feed only in government school, and it works in government schools. And let me tell you, for many children, it's the only meal of the day. The only meal. And those children eat enough for three of you in one city. They take four helpings. They take some food, keep it in their packet, take it home to feed the mother, the small children. Attrition has come down by 20%. Enrollment has gone up by 15%. The girl-child dropout has come down by 25%. I can do this. years and by 2020 we're going to have feeding program for 5 million children in India. 5 million children. The pop is a population greater than many many countries in the world. We have no money, no corpus. So we take government participate in the program, government gives us 60 percent and we raise 40 percent and 40 percent a lot of money. All of us give a lot of money and we give a lot of our personal money and the 40 percent comes to many donors. We set up a team, we do a marketing through the web, <coughs> We do door to door selling, we have a call center, and we go to corporates and we do many things, and it has built up over a period of time. And there have been occasions when we had no money. We had to stop maybe three years ago. We didn't have enough money, and we, had, we thought we were going to stop, but we all said we're going to borrow money. We borrowed two crores rupees from a bank to feed the child, to pay for bills, because we didn't have money. 
But you know what? Miracle of miracles. Somebody sent us a check for one crore within 10 days. And we got one crore from somebody else 15 days later. Money keeps coming. If you do a good cause, money keeps coming. Now, the other problem that we face as far as today, which requires innovative people like you to ask questions and to say, why can't we solve this problem to a unique problem? Look at this. Food storage and distribution problem. 55 million tons of grains in India is in storage through public procurement. The food is stored in the open in Punjab, Haryana, and other wheat growing states. The food is consumed in other parts of the country. The railways don't work, so what do you do? How should you store this? This is a problem. Inefficient power distribution. At Infosys, we had a problem. We said we're going to cut power, we're going to be a green company. We cut power per capita power consumption by 35% in three years. And mind you, that is an efficient company, but it's still cut it by 35% doing very innovative things, leveraging technology, leveraging new kinds of equipment, leveraging better practices, getting young people like you to become members of a green team and say they're going to change the world. Failing governance. You all know this, Anna Azare and all that. What do you do? What are the ideas? I'm just posing this question to you because you people are going to be leaders of tomorrow. What are they going to do to handle this issue of failing governance? Low urban voter turnout. Why do you people like you not go and vote? What is wrong with you guys? Why do people take it as a holiday? South Bombay voting is 45%. All those rich, fat people sitting down there in the luxury bungalows on their flats. The spiders fall around them, thank God. You know, they understand what is happening to the smell they get in their, you know, apartments upstairs. But moaning and groaning, not doing anything about it. Failing urban infrastructure. There's a spelling error deliberately because, you know, like my friend Abhay says, you've got to have a color to make sure nobody gives nazar to presentation, right? <laughs> Failing urban infrastructure. Why is infrastructure so bad? Why do our roads have potholes? How can you ensure the roads are no potholes? Why are there no payments? Why don't we make Bangalore a walking city? When we were kids, we used to go to school five kilometers away, and we used to walk five kilometers. Now, you guys, if you want to go one kilometer, you want a bike or you want a car. Why don't we make city a walking city? London is a walking city. New York is a walking city. SFO is a walking city. Tokyo is a walking city. All the cities are walking cities. Why can't we have walking cities? Why can't we have nice payments? Why don't people come up with innovative ideas? How to change the model that India is going along based upon the car, instead of the car, change it focus onto people. Lagging higher education enrollment rate. 17% GR in India, China has got 30%. 83% of young people like you in the age group of 18 to 24 are not going to college. And you know what they're going to do? They go to Srinagar and throw stones. They're joining the Maoists and taking to guns in eastern India. 200 districts of India are under the Maoists. And, and oh Lord, you know what they're doing? They're becoming your leaders. They're joining politics. And they're going to become your minister. <laughs> and you want to support the head. So we've got to get them into college, make them capitalistic picks. And you know why the Communist Party is not doing well in India? <laughs> JNU, all these colleges, the Jula Wallace, young people like you, idealistic, want to change the world, wearing a kurta like me, with the Jula, with the cloth, the bag, and all that, marching in the streets. They're all becoming capitalist picks with IT companies, the BPOs, and the financiers are all hiding them. So nobody wants to become a socialist. So where is ideology to change the world? Everybody's soul is sold to money. You want cars, bungalows, everything else. So how do, what do we do about creating idealism and increasing enrollment? Inefficient water management. The next war is going to be a war for water. So there are a lot of problems. There are important challenges that will need a whole new paradigm. I give you the example of how we executed a, 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 a executed program to solve a fundamental problem. But the idea is, how do you people come out with innovative ideas and innovative ways of executing those ideas to solve large social problems? And can it be done? Yes. There are many, many ways of doing it. Ramesh Ramnath started a portal, ipaydabribe.com. Look at that idea. Oh my God. If you go pay a bribe, go to the portal, put the guy's name and say, I paid a bribe to this guy. <laughs> oh. Visible to everybody around the world, right? Except we can't put the name. But then what happened? If all of you go and say, I paid this bribe to the transport department, I did this, it all comes there, and 60% of the price of the transport department, somebody is going to take notice. And the transport commissioner took notice and changed the way license are issued in Bangalore. So the idea of a portal, I paid a bribe.com, very simple idea, which any of you can do. So set up a portal where people can come and put their grievances, people can do something. I'm starting a portal 
with friends of mine for a very unique way to finance elections. Why? The root of corruption is the way elections are financed. So we're coming out with a new idea on the portal to change the way elections are going to be financed. A simple idea, but if it catches on, it'll change campaign financing in India for a long time to come. No one can resist an idea whose time has come. You know who said this? Victor Hugo, yes. May 17, 1991. A sparsely built man with a turban and a beard stood up in the House of Parliament and gave a speech lasting 45 minutes. At the end of the speech he said, the time has come for India to change, and no one can stop the march of an idea whose time has come. And he sat down. He was the Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh, as Finance Minister. And he changed the face of India. If all of you are prosperous today, all of you are doing well, his policy of liberalization, globalization has changed. And he made this famous statement. So if you have an idea, an idea whose time has come, an idea takes time for time to come. It's not going to come now and then. You've got to be at it, you've got to be perseverant. You can. Change the world. Thank you very much.